Have you ever heard of the name um, Chesley B. Sullenberger? The 155 people whom he rescued know his name. You may be aware that on January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 began a routine journey that ended in anything but routine. Shortly after taking off from New York's LaGuardia Airport, the Airbus 320, which held 155 passengers, lost powers, power to both engines after they had struck a flock of birds. Rather than panicking in a moment of, I would think, would be sheer terror, the pilot, Chesley Sullenberger, decided to land the plane in the Hudson River in order to avoid crashing into a densely populated area. Amazingly, no one was killed. No one died. After landing in the Hudson near by ferry boats, police boats, fire boats, and tugboats picked up passengers who were standing up to their waist in 35 degree water in 18 degree weather. What could have ended up in a disaster in a city that was already haunted by the September 11th attack uh, turned out to be one of the most amazing flight rescues in all of history. Sullenberger rescued all those people who had no ability to rescue themselves in what is known as the Hudson Miracle. There was even a movie, as you probably are aware of it, in which uh, Sullenberger was portrayed by Tom Hanks. Without Sully's, as he is known, heroic actions, who knows if anyone would have survived? We don't know. More than likely, the plane would not have just killed the passengers, or many of them, it probably would have killed many in the city. And yet, Sullenberger, or Sully as he is known, was able to prevent that. We love stories like that, don't we? Especially the ones that are true stories, of true heroism. Sully is a true hero. However, his story, like many others, as amazing as they are, cannot begin to compare with the greatest rescue story in all of history. And of course, I am talking about the cross. When God, our creator, rescued his people from their sin through the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to see how great this rescue is and how it impacts us, not only now, but how it will impact us in the future, into eternity. So this morning we're looking at rescued from Colossians chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, please turn to or turn it on to or Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. I will take any questions you might have in regards to this message. You can text that in. The number is in the handout we gave you at the door, and uh, I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Colossians chapter 1. Now, I'm actually going to begin reading in verse 1, so we can get kind of a context of what is going on here in Colossians chapter 1. It begins in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, 
strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Father, what a powerful, glorious passage. We, who needed to be rescued, and as we will learn, we're helpless to rescue ourselves. You took pity on us. You were gracious and merciful to us. And you rescued us from our own sin and the domain of darkness, the power of our enemy. As we learn more about this and are reminded of this truth, may you brand the gospel upon our souls that we might live it out, that we might appreciate it, and that we might tell others about it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, verses 13 through 14 are connected to uh, the prayer that we just read about that Paul had for this uh, young Christian church in the city of Colossae, which is in Asia Minor. As I read, he prayed that they would obey God's will, that they would come into an understanding of what it was and be thankful for what God has done for them in Christ. He here in verses 13 through 14 will continue the thought that we should all be thankful to the Father for what He's done for us in Christ, for He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. In our time together this morning, we're going to address why we needed to be rescued and how it impacts us. Beginning in verse 13, we see the reason for our rescue. The reason for our rescue. To be rescued means to be delivered or saved from a less than ideal situation or even person. It means that you need help and someone needs to come to your aid. In the context, the ones who needed to be rescued are all those who believe in the Lord Jesus. He's not just talking to this church in Colossae, he's talking to all who believe, because he includes himself, right? He says, for he rescued us. Paul includes himself and Timothy and all of the believers. And the one doing the rescuing is none other than God the Father, right? Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of saints in the light, for he, that is the Father, rescued us. He's the one doing the rescuing. And the reason for our rescue is found In the phrase, the domain of darkness, which is full and pregnant with meaning. The term domain can be understood as authority, tyranny, or even kingdom, the word that is used there. So in reality, the phrase, the kingdom of darkness, is not far off the mark. For several or excuse me, in several places in the Scriptures, we see this contrast of light and darkness, where light is representative of what is righteous or what is godly, and darkness is representative of unrighteousness or evil or wickedness. This is one of those passages. However, it doesn't just refer to evil versus good, righteousness versus unrighteousness, but rather the domain or the kingdom of darkness. This then tells us that this is the kingdom from which we had to be rescued from. This kingdom from which we have been rescued from, those who are in Christ, also tells us that we were once under its power. We were in its grip. We were under its authority. 
In Paul's testimony before King Agrippa, he recounts Jesus' words to him when when Jesus saved him on the road to Damascus and when he was converted. And I'll read to you from that passage. This comes from Acts 26, 18. He says this, to open their eyes, speaking to Paul what he would do when he took the gospel to the nations, so that they may turn, here is that analogy here, from darkness to light, now get this, and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So this language in Colossians is connected to what Jesus told Paul and what he would do in his ministry. This dominion or kingdom of darkness is that of Satan, the devil, our enemy, also known as the bright morning star or Lucifer. Being that it is his kingdom means that he has the power to rule over that kingdom. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means, what this power is and how it affected us before we knew Christ and how it still affects those who are without faith. They are still under its power. If you remember, ever since the fall that we read about in Genesis chapter 3, mankind has been affected by sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it affected every single human being. When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they passed down their sin nature to every single one of us, except for Jesus. In fact, we learned about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. If you remember, Paul wrote, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam's sin affected the human race. In its totality, all of humanity has been impacted by his sin. This is why we use phrases like, we were born in sin, or we're born sinners. Why? Because of our connection to Adam, our father. This is why we say we have a sin nature, right? We sin not only because we choose to sin, we sin because it's part of our nature, This refers to, you know, when you think about a two-year-old. A two-year-old doesn't have to be told or taught how to sin. They naturally know how to be self-centered and to be disobedient. It's part of who they are as a fallen human being, as a descendant of Adam. They instinctively know how to sin. They're born that way. We all are born that way. Now, true, they don't know better. However, it is also true that they are unable to act or be better because it's contrary to their nature. They do not have the ability to be good, to be righteous, to be godly. Now, you might say, or some might say, well, they're born that way, but they can learn to be good. They can learn not to sin, and they can learn to be righteous. However, that's not what the Bible says. Because sin is not just what we do with our actions. Sin has to do with who we are on the inside. None of us have the ability to overcome our sin on the inside. Even though we can do good things on the outside. Those good things are actually not that good at all. But don't take my word for it. What does the Bible say? Isaiah Chapter 64, we're familiar with this verse, right? For all of us, notice the totality and the encompassing nature of that phrase, all of us, everyone is affected and is this way, have become like one who is unclean. That phrase means we are to be clean meant that you were able to approach God. You had nothing to hold you back. You were not, you were guiltless. But he says we are unclean, all And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Even the good things, our good actions, are like a filthy garment. The reason 
that is so is because everything we do is affected and tainted by our nature, which is sinful. The phrase there, filthy garment, referred to soiled menstrual rags. You think about that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty disgusting image, isn't it? It's meant to be. It's meant to demonstrate how much we fall short of what is actually good and righteous and holy. Remember, God doesn't grade on a scale. God doesn't say, well, you, you know, you're sort of better than everyone else. You kind of are in that middle, so you're okay. God doesn't do that. He requires perfection. Why? Because he's perfect, he's holy, he's righteous. And when we do not meet who he is, that is the glory of God, which the Bible identifies for us, he identifies our good things as filthy rags. They fall short. They fall short of God's glory. Right? We may be able to control our actions, but we cannot change our hearts, which are sinful. This is known as the doctrine of the depravity of man. And, and we've talked about this in Romans, right? The Reformers called it the total depravity of man. It means that everything that we do and our nature is tainted and pervaded and saturated by sin. Its effects are, are to our entire being. All our thoughts, all of our actions are affected by sin. Humanity, that means everybody, being in this state and being able to do anything about it is helpless. Apart from being rescued, we cannot do good, and we don't even know what good is. We cannot understand the gospel, we can't understand the rest of the scripture. And it is Satan, those who have not been rescued, it is Satan who has power over those who are in his kingdom, under his dominion. And he blinds the unbelievers to the nature and truth of their sin and what true righteousness is. And they believe his lies. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. In case, in whose case, the God of this world, speaking of Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When you are born in sin, when you have a sin nature, you are under the dominion and the power and the authority of Satan, the enemy of our souls, the enemy of God, and he will blind you to the truth. He will tempt you. If you have not yet been rescued, to believe the lie that, hey, just do what you feel. Do what feels right to you. And if you fulfill those desires that you have naturally, you will be satisfied. That's what life is all about. And yet, as you look at the world, if you, if you study history, humanity is never satisfied with their sin. If you study human civilization, you will see that humanity progressively always gets worse in their sin. Why? Because they continue to pursue something that will never satisfy them, so they go farther and farther, and yet they feel more empty and less fulfilled. It's a lie. Cannot, nor do they believe in the truth of Scripture or the gospel. Apart from the rescuing of God, humanity is helpless. No one, apart from the intervening grace of God, has the ability to change the fact that they are blind and have a sin nature. There is no hope. There's no, over, there's no way to overcome this situation. This is why the rescue is needed. Because it affects everyone. This is why we need to be rescued, right? We learned in Romans chapter 3, very familiar passage, as it is written, chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous. Very inclusive, very encompassing statement. Not even one. There's no one who understands. There's none who seeks for God. They have all turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Seems pretty bleak, doesn't it? All. Not some, not most, all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God, which is what God requires. And he has the right to do that. Why? Because he's the creator. He made everything. But we're going to see that next week. God has the freedom and the right to do whatever he wants with his creation. And he requires perfection and none of us can meet it. We who were once a part of the domain of darkness, this tyranny of Satan, can only exclusively be broken by God. No one has the ability or the power to overcome the enemy's power except God. Not even our faith can overcome the power of Satan. Right? The faith that we place in Jesus to be rescued from our sin is that gift which God gives us, that ability to believe, and we believe. It's all of Him. And this is who we once were. Paul is obviously talking to Christians, and I presume so am I. This is who we once were. This is how we were before we were transferred into the kingdom of God's Son. But as he has said, and is true for us, we have been rescued from this domain of darkness. If you're in Christ, if you understand who God is and what he's done for you in Christ, you are no longer under the enemy's power and dominion and authority. You don't have to live under his authority. He no longer has authority over you. He has no power over you. You are not subject to his lies. You know the truth. All he can do is to tempt you to believe the lies. This is why Paul says we give thanks to the Father because we are no longer under that power. We don't have to submit to him anymore because he's no longer over us. We now can seek out God's will in his word, what it is, and seek to obey his will by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. This also informs us how we should relate to the world. It's too easy for us to forget that everyone who does not know God through Christ is in darkness. Everyone who is not a believer, a disciple of Jesus, is under the power and dominion of the devil. Satan, our enemy. That's why they reject the truth. This is why they believe such ludicrous lies that Everything came from nothing. And then it just poof came into being. I and mean, that doesn't even make any logical sense. And yet they believe it. This is why they can't stop sinning. This is why they continue in their, in their sin. This is why they think the murder of an innocent child on a scientific level is a choice. Because they're blind. Not true, some are worse than others, but all are unredeemed sinners. And so were we at one time. 1 Corinthians 6, we look at this passage a lot and I think it's good. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And we're like, yeah, Exactly. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, the homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, and such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. And we, you know, we read that list. Well, I don't know if I can find myself on that list. Oh. I'll help you. You see where it says idolaters? That's everybody. Everybody who places either themselves or something or someone else on the throne of their life or their heart is an idolater. And that's really what sin is. That's all of us. It should remind us to be humble. It should remind us to pity those who are under the power of the enemy should motivate us to proclaim the light of the gospel to them. Have you ever heard the phrase, I'm sure you have, you know, um, hate the sin, love the sinner? It's a good sentiment, 
Right? We must hate sin and call it for what it is and love people who are sinners. However, I think too often this phrase to hate the sin, love the sinner is used to ignore people's sin and not confront it and not call it for what it is. Well, we need to love them so we can't, we can't really you know, identify it as sin. That would be unloving. That would be offensive. That's not love, actually. That's not actual love. How can you hate the sin and love the sinner? How can you do this when you know that the sin you hate is affecting the one whom you love? To love the sinner and hate the sin means because you love them, you will kindly and truthfully, even at times boldly in love, help them understand that they are a sinner and they are offensive to God and their only hope is Christ. Yes, hate the sin, love the sinner, but tell the sinner about the sin because they, like us, need to be rescued from it and Christ is the only one who can do that. So the reason our rescue was needed is because we were helplessly bound to the kingdom of darkness. However, now that we have been rescued from our sin and its penalty, we have been granted entrance into the kingdom of God's Son. And So let's explore the impact of our rescue. The impact of our rescue in the last part of the passage. He transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. One of the spoils of being a conquering nation, of defeating another nation, Nation is to, you have the freedom to do with the citizens whatever you want. And one of the things that has happened over human history is that you transplant the people you have just conquered to a new area. And the reason that is done is so that you would demoralize them and prevent them from rising up against you. We've seen this throughout history. We've seen it in biblical history. When the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated by the Assyrians, the Assyrians transplanted Jewish people, Israelites, to Assyria and brought other nations into Israel. We've seen it in other parts. The Soviet Union did the same thing to other peoples. I encountered a group of them in Kazakhstan, a lot of the North Koreans that were transplanted there after the rise of the Soviet Union. Here the description as we see those who have been transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son is of those who have placed their faith in Christ, those who are saved, those who are redeemed, and how they have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of God's Son or His beloved Son. We are now in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Christ, as the Bible identifies it, or even the kingdom of heaven. We are no longer under the dominion of Satan. He still has power. He just doesn't have power over us. We have been freed from his power by the resurrected Christ. Now, when we speak of being transferred into the kingdom of his son, there are two major aspects of the kingdom of God or of Christ or the kingdom of heaven. Some people try to separate like, well, the kingdom of God is one thing, kingdom of heaven is another, and the kingdom of Christ, they're all the same. But there are two major aspects of this kingdom we are now a part of. There is what we call a present aspect of the kingdom in which we now live in and yet still a future aspect of the kingdom, right? This present aspect is in view here. We have been transferred into his kingdom, right? That's why Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Notice how kingdom and righteousness are synonymous. We live out righteously, godly now in the present age because we're in the kingdom, right? However, there are also passages that speak of a future aspect of the kingdom, which, if you're in the kingdom now, means you will be in the kingdom then. In fact, here's a couple of passages that talk about the future aspects of the kingdom, 2 Timothy 4.18, there's many of them here, there's just a few or a couple. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. 
To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That was Paul's hope, right? Second Timothy, this is his last letter. He's about to be poured out as a drink offering. He's about to be, as church history tells us, beheaded for his faith and his proclamation of the gospel. What's his hope? I will be part of that future kingdom. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's still yet to come, and we pray for it to come. So this is why this present and future aspect of the kingdom, we say the kingdom is already, we're already in it, but not yet. There's still future aspect of the kingdom, right? So let's talk a little bit about what does it mean to live in the kingdom now? And then we'll address, Lord willing, what it means to live in the kingdom in the future and what that will look like. Being in the kingdom now as it relates to the kingdom of Satan is that first, the penalty of sin has been removed. We no longer have to bear the weight and guilt of our sin. We've been forgiven. We've been cleansed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified. Because we are now in the kingdom of Christ and of God. There is no penalty for our sin because our penalty has been paid. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And when you come to a real understanding, which you can only come to by the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, when you come to this understanding of how wicked and how vile and how offensive your sin is, and then you realize, like, wow, my sin is... It is horrific. I, I have offended God and I've sinned against Him over and over. And yet He forgave me anyway and He's cleansed me and He says I don't have to answer for that anymore. So when you understand, I'm in the kingdom now. I'm a saint. I'm a child of God. I no longer have to carry the weight and guilt of that sin. It is a glorious truth. We who are worthy of the most unimaginable judgment have been rescued from it. Amen, indeed. The second reality of living in the kingdom now is that the power of sin in our lives has been thwarted. We no longer have to live under its power. We can now live righteously. We do not have to give in to temptation because we now have the ability or the ability to overcome our temptation. Being under the dominion of darkness means we're under its power, meaning that we can only obey its power, which was sin and wickedness. But we are now freed. Everything we did prior to our life in Christ was sin. However, now it does not have to be that way. We can now resist the power of the enemy. That's why Paul will tell us in Ephesians 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Meaning you need God's power. You can't just do it by yourself. But you can do it in His power. He says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. What? what, what, what? The strength of His might? That is the, the power of Almighty God. Supernatural power. We can put on the full armor of God so that we will be able to stand firm against the schemes, get this, of the devil, the God of this world, the one whose dominion we used to be under. We used to be blind and controlled by the enemy. Now we know the truth and don't have to give in to his lies. Which, by the way, when you stop and think about it, if you say, which is the scripture says in several places, if you say, I know Jesus, I believe in him, and yet it hasn't made any difference in your life, you're still the same sinner, you still act wickedly, you never desire or have uh, to, to live righteously, you have to ask yourself, do, do I really understand the gospel? Do I really believe? Because if I really believe, my nature would have been transformed, and I might not be perfect, but I would desire to obey, and I would obey at times. And I have the ability to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. If you do not have that ability, you may not understand what the true gospel is. Faith in Christ is submission to Christ. Right? You're saying, 
I submit under the authority of the king. I have sinned against the king. I can do nothing about that sin. I submit to his cross and his authority over my life. Right? To believe, to have faith, isn't just to agree with a truth in your head. It penetrates the heart. And it leads to submission. But we who now are in the kingdom understand that. We cannot be deceived. We now know the truth. 1 John 2 verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. He says something similar later on in the chapter. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you, but his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it has been taught you, you abide in him. That's what it means to live in the kingdom now. We live a life of obedience to Christ, our King. We have the ability to correctly and truly obey Him. Right? We'll see this later in Romans chapter 14. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, just living your life and doing whatever you want. In fact, in this context, He's saying, hey, give up some of your freedoms for the sake of your brother. Why? Because the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's kingdom now. We live righteously now. We submit to our king now. We are in his kingdom now. We are in the kingdom of his son. Therefore, we subject ourselves and submit to the king. He rules us by God the Holy Spirit who lives in us according to his word that we have in the Bible. Then there is that second aspect. We're already but not yet. There's this future aspect of the kingdom. And we could talk about that future reign of Christ here on the earth for a thousand years that we know as the millennium. That is future to us. But even that next phase, which I call it, of the kingdom, is already but not yet. Because even in the millennium, at the end of it, there will still be sin that needs to be eradicated, and it will. The future kingdom I want to talk about is the eternal state in the new heaven, the new earth. When Jesus will physically reign upon the new earth, there will be no more sin. And the redeemed, the rescued, will inherit it. Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed. Away. That is the future of all who have submitted to Christ by faith. We have been transferred into that kingdom. We are part of that kingdom. We are citizens of that future kingdom. And this entrance into this kingdom has been purchased, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This word picture. It's pretty clear, this word redemption. It's not the word that we usually see Paul use when he says that you have been bought with a price, right? That's usually just referring to a price that was paid to purchase something. This word refers to and is used to describe to purchase our freedom. It was used to describe when a slave would pay the price for their freedom. We might even say a ransom price. As you know, one of the most tragic times in our nation's history is when it was legal for one human being to own another human being. The predominant race that was enslaved in the United States in our history were blacks. 
These people who are no less created in the image of God than any other human being were stolen from their homeland and forced into slavery. The form of slavery that was present here in the United States was known as chattel slavery, meaning those who were owned as slaves were considered mere property, not people. They had no rights. Their children were born into it, and they could be sold at any time. As slaves, the entirety of their being was in the hands of their slave owners. They could not free themselves. They could not purchase their own freedom. They could not change their standing. The only way for them to be freed is if their owner set them free, which rarely happened. This is who we were. Prior to Christ, this is who we were. We were slaves of sin and darkness. All we lived in and committed was sin. We had no hope of being freed. We had no power to free ourselves. But Jesus, the very Son of God, came to redeem and pay that ransom price for us. He paid for our freedom. He purchased us from every lawless deed and freed us from the kingdom of Satan. We no longer are a part of His dominion. We no longer have to submit to His power because we have been purchased by Christ and His cross and we now have freedom. Amen? So we need to ask ourselves, how should, how should this impact, how should this, what this, should this look like in our lives? that we now live in the kingdom and still await the future aspect of it. Simply this, to pursue righteousness, to live godly and obediently now in this present age, no longer be a slave or subject to a yoke of slavery that Christ has freed us from. You have the power to overcome your temptations. There is no sin, no temptation that Christ cannot enable you to overcome. No addiction, no issue that you deal with on a daily basis that Jesus cannot help you overcome. You now have the ability to stand firm and say, no, I don't have to believe those lies. I trust in and submit to Christ. I can stand firm. You can whisper all the lies to me you want, Satan. I don't have to believe them. And I call upon God Almighty to help me in the power of His might to overcome my own temptation. Because I am in His kingdom. And I desire to walk according to His word. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. This is why we cannot bow down to a culture that continues to call evil good and good evil. We are not subject to that dominion anymore. We are subject to Christ and His Word. Think about this. If you are in Christ and are now in the kingdom and are headed for the future kingdom, how does that impact the way you live your life every day? What does it say about planning for the future? Here's what I mean. Did you know the Bible has nothing that describes retirement, the idea that you save up for most of your life so that you can sit around and do nothing the latter part of your life? There's no such thing. We're called workers. We're called servants. We're even called slaves. To Christ Workers of the gospel. Our work here in this present life is never done. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a retirement or to save up. The issue is that doesn't mean you get to check out and do nothing. If we're headed for that future kingdom, we should be living for that future kingdom. We still have work to do. There are still sinners who need to be saved. There is still the gospel that needs to be proclaimed. This also affects the way we treat people. How we view them. Do we have pity on them? We have been rescued. They have not. I mean, you see the images on the news today. and you, I mean, have you, have you noticed the hate and the anger directed toward anyone who would dare rob someone of their right to murder another person? I mean, it's gotten violent, right? I mean, we praise God for the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Not only was it a bad case of law, 
It's wicked. And yet look at the response to those who are pro-choice. They're angry. They're hateful. And, you know, and in some sense, we're like, you know what? You feel like smacking them upside the head or telling them how wicked they are. And if that is righteous indignation, I, I can understand that. But you know what? There also needs to be this sense like they're, they're slaves to their sin. They don't know any better. They're blind. They're under the dominion of Satan. We're not going to call what they do as good, but we are going to have pity and compassion on them and pray for their souls and give them the gospel. Now, it's true. Jesus said, there are many who will not believe. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. There are many who go through it. Narrow is the path that leads to life. There are few who find it. However, there are some who do, which is why we go out and call on all men everywhere to repent and believe in Christ because Jesus is going to save some. And we should never look upon those who are blinded by their own sin as though we were better than them because we're not. We are rescued. We are better off, but we're not better. Only Christ is. So what we've seen briefly today is our rescue from Satan's kingdom and entrance into Christ's kingdom grants us freedom over sin. He's the only one who does. He's the only one who can. Political leaders can't do it. The changing of laws cannot do it. You realize the only thing that laws can do is corral and cage in sin. That's all we can do. We can't go on the inside. Only God can do that through Christ. That should affect the way we view the world. Right? Our political leaders or changing of laws are not going to save us from our own sin. Only Christ is and only He can. Any questions? As we transition into a time of communion, I want you to look at one phrase and the, the music team can come to the platform. Look at this phrase. It's in verse 13. I didn't talk much about it, but I want to say something about it now. You see where it says, His beloved Son transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. It literally means the Son of His love or the Son who is the expression of His love, meaning the Father's love. The Son is so precious to the Father That he values him the most. That is who the Father gave so that you could be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son. God gave he who was most valuable to him so that he might bestow his love upon us. As we remember him now, may we not forget the high price that was paid. Father, you are a kind, generous, good, patient, and loving God. As we have reviewed and been encouraged by the truth of the gospel and our being rescued from the domain of darkness, Father, may we never forget who we were so that we might glory in who we now are because of your grace. Thank you that no sin is so wicked that Jesus' death could not cover it. May we remember him now in a worthy manner. It's in his name we pray. Amen.